Hi, welcome to Seymour's World. I've been gone a couple of weeks, but I am back, and we have a wonderful show for you today. Uh, it is all about China. Is China a real threat to you? Our guest today is Jay Henderson, a specialist on the real China. Not the China you see in 30 seconds on the news, but the China that has become a country balancing socialism, communism, capitalism, and unbelievable growth. We will have a many faceted discussion on the implications for the average American in the way an established superpower like the United States manages its relations with a rising power like China. Jay, welcome to the show. This is not your first time here with us. Wonderful to be back with you, Seymour. Well, the, uh, the reason I, I, I begged you to come back, A, is because we had so many people who were very interested in understanding the term, the real China. And at the same time, you and I had quite a discussion about where America stands in its relationship to China. So before we get into a lot of detail about what's going on, let's refresh a little bit and tell people who you are and what you've done. Well, thank you, Seymour. Um, I uh, have had three major jobs in my life in a career of about 45 years. I retired a few years ago. Uh, the first one was I was in New York with the group that hosted the ping pong team. Uh, I was uh, an interpreter, escort, and a program per, uh, officer for them for a while in the uh, 70s and early 80s. And then I went to Hong Kong to open up China for American universities on behalf of the Institute of International Education. And I stayed there for um, a few years before coming back to Washington, D.C. and running the Voice of America's television and radio broadcast to China and uh, nine other countries in, in Asia, Burma, Korea, Indonesia, etc. cetera. Um, but I've been a China specialist all my life and uh, continue to think that the United States relationship with China is uh, the most important for the United States now and for the rest of my life. Let me ask you something. Everybody asks me because they know I've been doing business in China for 30 years. Do I speak Chinese? Do you speak Chinese? Yes, I speak some Chinese. I didn't start learning Chinese until uh, I uh, was out of college. I was in the Navy and then I went to Taiwan for a few years. Um, but I've learned most of it just bit by, by, by speaking it. And Mandarin, Cantonese? Yes, Mandarin, taxi Cantonese, but Mandarin. Because I know that when we have spoken and we went to lunch the other day at a Chinese restaurant and I could tell you knew Chinese just by the way you were ordering the food, which was wonderful. And uh, by the way, Sue wants to have lunch with us at that Chinese restaurant. Oh, so, wonderful, sure. Which will be good. You wrote a book or you wrote a piece called Peking Past Peking. Could you explain that a little bit? Peking Past Peking is a uh, subject of mine uh, that I've been focusing on for the last three or four years. Uh, that the, the idea of peaking past Peking is whatever conclusions or whatever observations I present and put forward, it is only a narrow slice of what is all of China. If you wish to aggrandize what I'm saying to the larger picture, uh, you're welcome to do so. But I'm just saying what I see through my little peek through the keyhole into China. And one of the things that I've done since I uh, stopped working full time uh, five years ago, has been going out to the um, far reaches of China where the Han Chinese, the minority, start to become the, 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 sorry, the majority when they start to become the minority, right there at the tipping point to see what was happening. And what I have seen, and this is just a peak, is incredible development, even out there. Of course, I've seen the incredible development that's occurred on the East Coast. Uh, we've all seen that. The world knows about China's success story from the time that Deng Xiaoping came back and decommunized the countryside and, and uh, capitalized the economic system, turned it into a capitalist uh, system. Uh, we've seen the tremendous progress, but the rumor was that out there in the hinterlands, those people were, were suffering, were not, not progressing at the rate of their brothers and sisters or their cousins on the East Coast. I went and saw it, and from what I could see, my peak was it's happening out there too. 30 years behind, 20 years behind, but they're catching up. They're on the same upward ladder. Is there a, uh, an issue of these people that are in the hinterland, if we can use that term, are they uh, trying to move to areas on the East Coast, the Shanghais, the 
Beijing's, the Hainan's, because there's more money there for them to be made, or are they staying where they are? In domestic or internal migration in China has been a, a facet of life in China for the last 30 years, uh, especially as people have set up factories uh, along the East Coast. Uh, young people have left the farm and have gone to these factories to get jobs and save money and go back home. But I, th I think another part of answering your question is that, um, meanwhile, life continues uh, out there in the hinterland. And I call it hinterland because the Chinese call it BND, which is the uh, remote uh, areas. Um, life has gone on out there, and uh, you're starting to see broad avenues, uh, hospitals, uh, schools, etc. Um, modern systems of sanitation. Uh, life is, is, is on the upward swing out there. It's not exactly nearly as, as uh, primitive, I will say, as it was uh, when I first started going out there in, in the late 1970s when uh, roads were creek beds and uh, schools were just uh, uh, dirt floors and uh, Life is totally different out there now, and it's going to get it's going to get different. I think I see the same thing when I travel because I travel in the economic zones, basically where there's factories, and I I, I see people uh, coming in to work from the farms and from the hinterlands to try to find jobs in some of the industrial areas. But I see also when we go further out the new roads, and I see a lot of cities that are being built. And uh, before we get into the relationships between U.S. and China, I want to talk about that a little bit, Jay. There are so many cities and areas that I see that are waiting for people to move in, if mm. that's the right terminology. Mm -hmm. Well, whenever you travel outside of the big cities, or even in the big cities, and, and here I'm meaning cities who are that are of the tens of millions of uh, people, uh, I went to a city called Panjin not too long ago at the mouth of the estuary that leads into the Bohai Gulf, a city of only two million people. And I saw thousands of buildings, 40 stories high, and they were empty. These were apartment buildings. I saw hundreds of office buildings uh, along my, my trip, uh, not necessarily all in the city of Panjin. I saw hundreds of empty office buildings, sort of like if, you're gonna, if you build it, they will come. Now, they may have overshot. It, it is a bit of a risk. It's a gamble. That, the, that these places are not going to fill up. But I think the building on the Peking Pass Peking thing, where I went out to the hinterlands, the, wherever you go in China, you see growth. And the growth that we've seen over the last 30 years, which has been spectacular, phenomenal, unbelievable, nobody saw it. They are not on a plateau. This is what these empty buildings suggest to me. They're on a continued growth pattern, arc or growth uh, a pattern that is going to lead them up. We now have, because of what's happened over the last 30 years, uh, hundreds of millions of people have been, quote, lifted out of poverty, but we have about 300 million citizens of China who are empowered with disposable income, with uh, cell phones, televisions, automobiles, etc. And what I see in these empty buildings that, that are around China, I, if you look into the future and imagine that even half of them are full, you're going to have 700 million Chinese that are empowered, are going to have disposable income, that are going to have a tremendous impact on the course of world events. And, the, you know, from, and we're not getting into this until the second part of our, of our talk, but we're going to talk a little bit about what impact that has on American businesses when you have 700 million potential consumers in a foreign country. That's, a, that's an amazing amount of, of customers that are waiting for, whether it's jeans or toys or whatever it may be. It is huge, absolutely huge. I'd like to um, talk about uh, the panda huggers. And the reason <laughs> I, I, I love that term, you coined it. Uh, I didn't oh, coin oh, that term. Well, you, you <laughs> gave it to me, I put used it that it, way. Yeah. And I, I, I like it. it. Could you explain it for us? Well, panda audience? huggers come from the, uh, the tree hugger that's the origin of the term. Uh, a tree hugger is, is someone who wants to protect the environment and who will go out and hug a tree so that you can't cut it down. A panda hugger is, regardless of what China does, uh, no matter how bad it is, 
uh, you're going to hug that panda. You're, you, you, you're, you're blind to reality. You're, gonna, you're a panda hugger. You can't think of anything but how good China is. That's, that's sort of the origin of that term. And I've been accused of that from time to time, not uh, by too many people, but by a few, because I'm not full of uh, vituperative, I'm not full of uh, negativity about China. I see a growing, burgeoning, thriving China that's working on solving its problems and is going to be a huge uh, lifelong, sorry, all of my life at least, a, a huge uh, partner for the United States and for the world, a huge force, and hopefully it'll be a force for the, for the good. And when you say things that are about China that are positive, sometimes people think uh, China does nothing, but China, there's nothing good about China. And if you say something positive, you're a panda hugger. Well, I have to say that we have a uh, esteemed senator from Nebraska. Uh, I think his name is uh, Roman Ruska. No, this right? is back in the 50s. Yes, right, right. In the, back in the 50s. Yeah. And it just shows you how, how things uh, uh, don't change, you know, the more things stay the same and all that stuff. He said, we want China to look like us. Well, he actually said, uh, <laughs> this is after, after the end of the war, the Second World War, and, and there was a lot of... Um, uh, evangelism going on in the world and the United States wanted to uh, help other countries be become like us and what Ruska said, Senator Ruska said was, I want to lift Shanghai upwards, upwards, ever upwards until it's just like Kansas City. Yeah, well, <laughs> he was from Nebraska, so he, you know, Kansas City to him was the model for the world. Of course, of course. I, I think we have to understand that um, uh, this, uh, and this is for our audience, uh, our show, Seymour's World, is not just about talking to people. It's, it's trying to opening, open up your minds and try to facilitate conversations about things like China. Because we do have in our press a tremendous bias against China. And I'm not saying everything is perfect in China, but if you were to tell me is everything perfect in the United States, I think we all know the answer to that. So we have to sometimes take a step back and talk to people like Jay, who is a true specialist in China, and understand that uh, what we read in the newspaper or what we see in a 30-second soundbite on television is not necessarily everything there is. And I think it's important for you as an audience and for all of us to take that step back and begin to understand that a country like China, with everything that's going on, can be a friend, not a foe. It depends how you want to portray yourself and how does the United States want to portray itself. So let's talk for a few minutes before we have to take a break. I want to talk about the Chinese investments in the United States. Mm. That has been a very quiet piece in the last few years because five years ago, everybody was discouraging Chinese companies from coming to, to the USA. Go ahead. Well, what you read in the newspapers is that China is uh, uh, plotting to take all of our jobs away from us. That uh, every time the United States and China work together in the business area, it's simply to, uh, it leads to American workers being laid off and jobs being exported and goods being sold back to us at, at a high price or even at a low price, but lots of goods so that it adds up to a big trade deficit. This is what you hear. Um, actually, a lot of that, there's a grain of truth to it, but on, there is a lot of other evidence that shows uh, that people need to know in order to have a balanced point of view. For example, uh, there was about 87 million, billion, sorry, billion dollars uh, invested in the United States last year alone by Chinese investors. Did you say 87 billion? 87 billion, right. Um, I know of one investor who is putting a billion dollars into the state of Ohio, hiring thousands of American workers. He's shifting his manufacturing capabilities from uh, Fuzhou, China to Dayton, Ohio. It's in the newspapers back there, and he's the toast of the, of the state, the governor, and everybody uh, welcomes this uh, billionaire from China who's creating jobs and shifting his manufacturing to the United States. None of that gets noticed, none of that gets mentioned, but because of you, your show and, and having me on and other people, uh, we can maybe start to get the word around at least that 
there's another side to that that picture. What about the geopolitics of it all? Uh, does the administration, the current administration, or anybody else out there see, wait a second, this could help United States industry so much by allowing Chinese investors to come in here and do business? There you have to watch what they do and not what they say. Um, what they say sometimes can be a little bit political, and it's easy to bash China. It is easy to, to, uh, to say China is, is, is stealing our jobs. But if you look at how the policy is carried out, uh, I'm actually quite uh, sanguine about the future because of the way, of the way that U.S.-China relationship has been managed in the past. Uh, it's been one of the best managed uh, relationships that the United States has had. And that is a gratis to the leadership of the United States and, and China, but certainly the leaders of the United States and the State Department. Remember Ronald Reagan? He was a good friend of Chiang Kai-shek, and he was going to get into, he was a big anti-communist. He was going to get into, into office and, and do something about that. And four months after he was in office, he was in Beijing on a state visit. Um, we've had a very well-managed uh, relationship. This, however, I must say the pivot, uh, President Obama's pivot, uh, as well-meaning as it is, is being interpreted by the Chinese as not being a very friendly act. And uh, part of that, I think, is because the um, only U.S. government agency that is financed enough to be able to do anything when the President says do something different is the Defense Department. And so they're uh, shifting military resources to Asia. They're um, e equipping our allies with more uh, equipment, uh, planes, uh, guns, etc., and training. Um, and so what the Chinese have seen with regard to the pivot is one government <laughs> agency is, is pivoting, and it's the Defense Department. And here it comes. There's a lot of defense stuff coming. They don't see and, and any of the other 30 some odd U.S. government agencies doing a pivot and coming out and trying to build new and constructive relationship with China. Uh, that's been going on, but there's, it isn't a lot more suddenly steeply up like it is in the defense area. So that part of our relationship, uh, as much as I admire the, the way the overall relationship has been managed, that, that part is something I wish we could do more about. But as long as our, those other agencies of our government don't have the funding, uh, they're probably not going to be able to. It's only the Defense Department. I, I, before I retired, I was part of a multi-agency task force uh, that wanted to solve a problem, and the Defense Department was there as well as about 15 other government agencies, and we all agreed on what the problem was and what we should do about it. So it came time to develop the action plan, and nobody had any money to carry anything out except the Defense Department. They said, well, we'll share it, we'll fund it, as long as we're the, we will run it. Well, you're, we'll bringing, take care you're bringing something to the table right now that's important to Hawaii, too, yes. because, you know, that's one of the big issues is uh, what is going to happen with the Defense Department here in Hawaii. Mm. We need to take a break. Okay. I want to come back to the pivot. I think it's very important to understand the relationship from, uh, from the U.S. government side. Uh, what does China see with all the information that's coming to them from the U.S.? Mm. Uh, we'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, we have to take a short break. I'm Seymour Kazimersky on Seymour's World at ThinkTech Hawaii. Hi, I'm your host on ThinkTech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, ThinkTech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia, and by Asia we mean anything from Hawaii south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world, uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Hi, welcome back to Seymour's World on ThinkTech Hawaii. We are here with Jay Henderson, a China specialist, and we're hearing some wonderful, interesting news about how do we deal with China? Now, we're the big, the big guy, right? 
or how does China deal with us? And we started uh, off, to, or we ended the last session talking about the pivot. And the pivot is basically where the U.S. is spending its time and money in relationship to Asia. And when we say Asia, we really mean China at this point of the conversation. And it's important for us to realize that uh, China sees us as uh, giving armaments to all the countries around them and wondering what what is our real modus operandi? Are we, are we trying to do something uh, to be aggressive against China? Are we trying to do something to be defensive for our own nation? And we're going to talk to uh, Jay about that and get his opinion about it. So Jay, what do the Chinese think when they when they hear that uh, there's more uh, arms being sold to the countries around China? Uh, they think it's very unsettling of relationships and they're um, uh, not happy uh, about it. They do uh, have a word for it, they call it containment. They think the United States is uh, busy trying to contain China by working with Japan and India and, and uh, Vietnam and other countries on China's periphery. Uh, bolstering their their security, particularly Japan, because you know China, Japan, that's a real tinderbox right there. They have all kinds of uh, tripwires uh, going, and and because of our security treaty with Japan that we've had uh, ever since Second World War, um, you know the United States is duty bound to come to Japan's rescue, and we're not duty duty bound to come to China's rescue. So if there's a war, we're duty bound to to be on Japan's side. But China is also a fairly aggressive in doing things that ignite the situation. They may not have fire yet, but they're taking over some islands. They're doing things that are obviously aggressive, aren't they? Well, they're doing some very provocative things. Just a, within the last month, I understand they've started dredging in some of the disputed mm -hmm. areas, trying to make an island long enough to build a runway on. And that's very explosive to be doing, very not uh, conducive to stability at all. And the Chinese say that they're that they uh, want the region to be stable. They're, they uh, hate in instability. Uh, and you know, I think they're creating, I think they're, they create a, a lot of animosity of their own against the United States too, even though at the top level, uh, the relationship between Xi Jinping and President Obama, President Xi Jinping of China and President Obama, uh, was very constructive when the two of them, has been very constructive every time the two of them have met. Um, and as I say, the State Department and the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs are working very, very hard on well, at least 50 different areas trying to maintain a stable relationship. So there's a lot of momentum going in that area. I just don't understand when the Chinese do something that is provocative. In one way, you know, I know the title is, of your show today is, is China a big threat to the United States? Um, <laughs> China's worst enemy is its own people in some ways. And the United States, sometimes you could even say our worst enemy is our own people, the way we're tearing each other apart. Well, there's another one, um, and I discussed this on another show, that what is happening in China with the so-called annexation of some of the lands in the, in the South China Sea is very similar to what Israel is doing, where they're annexing uh, land and building uh, very provocative apartment buildings and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, there's two sides to every story. And we as a uh, mature audience has to understand that there are reasons that people do this. I don't think that uh, for the same, if you look at the, Isra the Israeli situation on building settlements, and if you look at what China is doing to uh, do something in the South China Sea, that those are provocative in nature. They do it for what they think is important to them, and it may set off a tone of uh, animosity or a tone of anger in other people, but they have reasons to do it. And I think we all have to be respectful of under, understanding the motives behind those things. Now, before we go any further, you just came back from a trip, and I wanted to get some photos to our audience because they see Shanghai and they see Beijing and they see all these sorts of things. And you go really, I mean, I've heard you go on bus trips way deep into China over the years that you've had. So I'm gonna ask Zuri to put, out some, put some of those pictures up on the screen and if you could identify them for us and tell them what they are. Well, this is a market in uh, the town of Lanzhou and I just picked it be because look how clean the market is. You know, usually you think of uh, street markets and street vendors as being 
sloppy, but this is this is immaculate. This is the new China. Beautiful. Let's see the next one, Siri. This is a uh, horse town oh, wow. uh, called La Musa. It's high up in the uh, in the Himalayas, uh, the far eastern end of the Himalayas in Sichuan Province. Um, and I just picked it because you see they're driving a herd of sheep and a couple of uh, horses and, and a dog. And it's right through the middle of the town. And it's right through the middle of the town. I like it. Uh, but I went into a store on that very same street and they were selling cashmere sweaters for 100 US dollars. Of course, this is before you start to bargain, but <laughs> that's, that's amazing. You never could yeah. find it it's like that before. Now, let's see the next slide, Siri. Oh, wow. Uh, this is a town high, high up in those same mountains uh, called um, uh, Kirat, I think is the name of it. Name slips my mind at the moment. At the moment. It, there's a large monastery up there. Quite a, nice, quite a nice place. It's that makes picturesque. you want to go and visit. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Next, Siri. Uh, this is what I call a pop-up town. This is the town that has almost no inhabitants, believe it or not. They built this town. It's one of the things we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Uh, this is in Sichuan province, up in the mountains. And uh, unlike any town I'd ever been in, because it's virtually a ghost town, they built it in hopes that people will come. Amazing. <laughs> this is, I love this picture. This That's is a beautiful a, palm tree. Uh, this is a p fake palm tree. A it's fake palm tree. Green plastic. Uh, and it's in a village, a village called Litong, which is at 14,000 feet. It's a totally Tibetan village. It's right on the Tibet border with Tibet in Sichuan. It's, it's 14,000 feet. It's higher, actually, than, than Lhasa. And oh as their God. symbol, right downtown, they have a plastic, big, green plastic palm tree. I love it. This is called Xiangcheng. Uh, I love Xiangcheng because you can see the town there on the left, and on the right, up in the hill, you can see a uh, Tibetan monastery. Right. How Quite. far is that from, from um, uh, let's say, uh, Chengdu or some of the other areas? Uh, that's a 10-hour to 14-hour bus ride up to Litong and then another six hours south from Litong to Xiangcheng. It's a all, huge all, country, isn't it's it? It's beautiful, too. There's it's, nothing up there but pine trees and bubbly brooks, and it's just wonderful. I, I have made it, um, and I think I told you, Sue and I have to go back to China in May, and... Um, we want to go deeper into China rather than just do the Yangtze oh, yeah. River cruise that we were talking about. So that's something we want to do. And when you see a town like that, it just says to you, go and see it. It's just beautiful. Yeah. All right, let's get back to the political okay. discussion because that's really what we're here for. Um, Michael Pillsbury wrote a book called Marathon. And the, uh, the title or subtitle was China's Secret Strategy to Replace America as the Global Superpower. Michael Pillsbury is a Defense, Defense Department China specialist, has been there for many years, very senior, very knowledgeable, has written a number of uh, uh, very impactful things about China. He's not a neocon that I, that I can see. Uh, he does, however, always have things to say about China which uh, may make you worry about China. His book, The 100-Year Marathon, is about China from 1949 to 2049. And during that time, China is picking itself back up off of its feet, uh, back up onto its feet out of the rubble that it was in in 1949 when they took over. And it's got a 100-year-long strategy, and he maintains that at the end of that strategy, uh, they want to have replaced or dislodged, displaced the United States as, as the world's number one leader in absolutely everything. And what do you think? Um, I certainly think Michael Pillsbury's point of view is valid, and we need to listen to it in the chorus of uh, voices out there. His is a responsible one, well-informed. He wrote this book on the basis of... Um, a lot of highly classified information sources. It, he told me it took him a long time to get it uh, right. Uh, he self-censored in order to not reveal any classified information, then surrendered it to the, to the um, people who control that stuff at places like CIA and Defense Intelligence Agency and got it cleared by them. So it's very authoritative. And it certainly we have to listen to it that China has, see China has it's not monolithic. They have a group of, let's call them generals, or a group of people who are 
uh, ultra conservative who want China to be number one in the world and want to use the United States as sort of, um, uh, you know, something to step on so that they can step up or who want to displace us. I don't doubt that that, that, that exists in China. But, you know, we, in the United States Congress and elsewhere in the United States, we have also we have people who um, don't see China clearly and have a particular grudge against China and are always it can be counted on to knee-jerk uh, go against China. Well, this is these, China has the same kind of knee-jerk anti-American people as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are in the military. And this is what uh, Mr. Pillbury is writing about. I'm going to go out on a limb because I always do, and sometimes I get my hand slapped or whatever it is, but I don't believe that. And the reason I don't believe it, Jay, is because I've been doing business there for a long time. And I think business is more important than politics. Politics follows business. It doesn't create business. And to me, what I have seen in China and the growth in China, uh, China is very interested in becoming a huge superpower in many different ways but mostly economically. And I don't think they want to conquer the world. They may want to become the largest economic power in the world, and that could be, and it probably will happen. In our, I think in the next 20 years it will happen, but I don't think they want to conquer the world. I think that is really uh, a, a term that we have to look at very, very carefully when we analyze China in this pivot that you were talking about before. We gotta take a short break, Jay. So uh, we will be back. I'm Seymour Kazimersky. I'm on Seymour's World with Jay Henderson, our China specialist. We will be back in a minute. Thank you. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Hi, welcome back to Seymour's World. I'm Seymour Kazimersky on Think Tech Hawaii. Our guest today is Jay Henderson, our China specialist. And we've been talking about what the, China means to many different people. And I think one good point that you brought up, Jay, was that just like we have Republicans and conservatives, and within those groups we have uh, ultra-conservatives and neoconservatives, we have all different factions. China has the same thing. Uh, I think we need to come to grips with is China, well, the topic today, is China a real threat to the U.S.? And uh, I don't think so. I think if we treated China more as a partner than an adversary, I think we would get much further ahead with China. I find in business, and I, I, I have so many compatriots who do business in China with me over the last 30, 40 years, we all realize that they're wonderful people to do business with, extremely reactive to the needs that you have if you're making a product, very willing to spend huge amounts of money in R&D to, to try to make a better product for a lower price. Uh, this is where uh, I, I believe the growth in China is going to be, and that's the relationship the United States should be looking at rather than this pivot of sending armaments to all the countries around China trying to say, watch out, we're going to take over for you. I'm going to end that part of the conversation unless you want to add oh, something yeah. to it. No, I really need to add one thing Go there about it. the pivot because the pivot wasn't intended to be that way. The pivot was in all of the centuries before this, we focused on Europe and we've done a good job. but. This next century is going to be, there's a tremendous amount of activity that's going to happen out there in Asia. We really have to pay a lot more attention to Asia. Let's pivot and turn our attention towards Asia. But not just militarily. So what's happened has been in carrying out that policy, the one agency that's able to carry it out is the Defense Department. 
maybe the Commerce Department, but that doesn't get heralded. In your, I mean, even the Commerce Department, take the, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Multinational uh, Trade uh, Agreement that the United States is, is, is um, trying to bring about because of the pivot. Well, China is excluded from the TPP. So China has gone ahead and has started their own um, alternative to the TPP. They've started their own alternative to the World Bank. They've started the Asian Development Bank. All of these things because in our pivot, we just haven't included China. And so China's feeling left out and contained, and this is the way they're reacting. All right. Well, it's, uh, I happen to agree with you, and that's only because I'm coming from the economic point of view, not from the policy point of view. Now, you just had a trip to uh, Bokai Bay, didn't you? Yes. Tell us a little bit about it and show us something that I, I doubt less than 1% of our audience, even even a half of 1% have seen. Go for it. Okay. Uh, as part of my this quest for looking at remote areas of China, uh, for the first time, and I've been to China over a hundred times, for the first time I went up into the industrial northeast to see what it was like. And I went on a trip around the uh, Bohai Gulf. Uh, I went to Panjian, it was the first town, it was a uh, town of two million. And I went over to Dandong, and I'll come back to Dandong in a minute. And I went down to Dalian, and then I went across the Bohai Gulf on an overnight boat to Tianjin, and back up to Beijing on the bullet train. It was only 30 minutes from Tianjin to Beijing. I wanted to talk about Dandong because Dandong is a Chinese city on the border with North Korea. Right. And so I spent a couple of days on the Yalu River, drinking Yalu River beer. And How was it? Oh, it was wonderful. Very, <laughs> as long as it was cold, it was good. Had a lot of North Korean food, everything but dog. And uh, that's where I sort of drew the line. Then I went up the Yalu River uh, with a friend to a place called Ibu Kwa, which is a place that means one step across. And there you could actually see a North Korean island about as far away from me to, if our audience can't see, but there's a wall about 15 feet from us. It's very close by. And that was North Korea? That was North Korea. There was a, a fence and some Chinese guards there keeping me from doing the foolish thing and stepping out. Then they offered me a, a chance to buy a, a lady, a little old lady came up to me and for eight US dollars she offered me to, a whole uh, clump of North Korean money. So I got this North Korean money. I hope that I, you can see it. Yes, they can. Uh, I'll try to get it so that it doesn't, the She's lights don't shine on it on too, too much. Too. Okay. And that's, uh, on each bill is a picture of? Oh, Kim Il-sung or Kim Jong-il or Kim, wow. uh, Kim Jong-un. Yeah. And their wives. This is discontinued money, but it was fun. And then I went out on it for a cruise on the Yalu River. And I actually got uh, North Korean territory in between me and China. These, these, these islands that were in the middle of the river, the Chinese guards told us it was okay, and we went out there with about 50 Chinese tourists. It was fun. I was a little bit worried. I got some good pictures. I put it in a blog called Rick and Jay's Fantastic Adventure at blogspot.com. Um, and uh, some of the pictures that I took of, the, of, the Nor of North Korea when I got to the other side of the islands and again got close to North Korean territory were like Norman Bates. You could see it was like psycho. You, you really worried about uh, them wow. coming out and getting you. This picture here is a North Korean vendor came out to our little ship and, I know, and I sold see pickled that. eggs and stuff to us for a while. So the um, North Korean ship could come to you. You were still in the China side of the river. No, we were in the Yalu River, which was but on. That's a border. The, it is, but the concertina was on the was on the Chinese land. On the on the North Korean, there wasn't any fence uh, or anything. Uh, yes. And they so they so the river was neutral, but in the middle of the river were these islands, and they were North Korean. So you are the first person I have met then who has actually been in North Korea. And, you didn't and, get your passport stamped up. And I didn't jump off and say, I'm yes. up my passport because I want to defect yeah. <laughs> like one American did. No, I'm not going to do that. I was, I was worried. I wanted to have a low profile while I was out there, and I was glad to get back uh, to terra firma in, inside it, China. I bet. It was lots of fun. You know, that's interesting that um, North Korea, uh, that close to China, there's, there, you don't see a lot of soldiers on both sides, do you? No, I didn't see any soldiers, but we did have one man who, we, when we waved at him, he went like this with a gun. Oh, uh, no kidding. That he was his a, wave a with a cough in his hand. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. And we saw dozens of North Koreans farming and fishing. They, they have these little boxes with a glass bottom. And they put the box inside the water, but they don't want the water to come over the top. So it's like goggles. Mm -hmm. And they're able to look down into the water and see fish and <coughs> stab no, them like I'm that. Really? Dozens of them doing that. 
This is a picture of the bridge across the Yalu. That uh, sign there actually says that China's on this side and North Korea's on the other side. You can see the, the North Korean side. flag, yeah. And I, and I translated as, don't even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> very, very cool. Now, when, uh, when you do that, Jay, uh, do you get a guide that goes with you? No. Or do you do it on your own? I just was because on my of own. Because you speak yeah. Chinese. Yeah. I find that the deeper I go into China, you better have a guide with you because they really do not have a very, command, very good command of English. You know, and, and naturally, I don't have a very good command of Chinese, so we don't get very far. Uh, it's even happened to be closer in uh, to some areas in Beijing and Shanghai when you get outside just uh, you know a hundred kilometers outside you find yourself whoops uh, what do I say now well, I a travel lot of pointing with, you know I travel with no pre or pre-designed plan with no guides I'm riding down the road on a bus if I see something interesting I jump off and go down and a couple of days later I go back up to the road and hail down the next bus and continue on down the road no kidding and you do it by yourself well, yeah, or with one other person. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. Usually I like to go with someone who doesn't speak Chinese and doesn't know China that well. I can show them around. I don't have anybody to sass me. Let's, let's talk about China's growth. You mentioned it right at the beginning of the show, how you have seen uh, this exponential growth in China over the last few years. Uh, do you have any perception as to where it's going to go? If you describe the last 25 years, for instance, where's the next 25 years going to grow? Well, as I said, I don't think they're on a plateau. They're going to continue to have explosive growth. And um, we're going to have several hundred million more Chinese who are worldwide, if that's the word, worldwide, empowered, able to travel, uh, spend money and influence the course of events. And they're going to be capitalist in their uh, economic theories. They're going to remain socialist, communist in their political theories. They're going to uh, continue to focus on stability. It's going to continue to be a one party. They're not interested in multi-party democracy, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> I think you have to, though, comment on the fact that you know, 30 years ago, there was total censorship of journalism. Now there's very, very few things that are censored in journalism. Still all the hot button issues, but there's a lot of things in China that are not. It's the same thing with religion. There's a lot more religion. Uh, there's a lot more, I'm going to call them human rights uh, in China, a lot more freedom of speech, freedom of assembly than there was. Still circumscribed heavily compared to what it was and compared to what we would like it to be. If we only we could lift Shanghai up until it's just like Kansas, Kansas City, then right, everything right, would be right. perfect. <laughs> Where it's going to be in a few more years, I think this could be more and more and more uh, of, of all of that. Um, and China, one thing that, that you, it's interesting that there are two big problems right now, and they, they talk about them more than we do. Their big problems are pollution and corruption. Mm -hmm. And if you look at their plans, their five-year plans, They've got a whole bunch of programs designed to address the, the pollution and the corruption problems and the other problems that they've got. And if you look at their previous five-year plans, you see that the problems that they focused on 25 years ago, one by one, they got rid of them. Mm -hmm. So I think that in the next 15, 20 years, China's going to get rid of its pollution problems. It's going to get rid of its corruption problems, at least so that it's, it's like Kansas City. <laughs> I think, you know, my feeling is the, the, uh, the, the look of China as Kansas City just doesn't fit with me. I'm sorry. Well, I'm it from Kansas work. City. It's quite a nice little place. For me, um, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, have you on the show, Jay, just so people can see and look at the other side. And there's many sides to it. It's just not one side or two sides. But uh, China itself is a growing country. And uh, we in the United States are tired uh, or I think I am anyway, tired of trying to tell everybody how to live their lives. And we saw that in the Middle East. We see it in so many areas where we've gone in and nothing has happened. It's just reverted right back to the way it is. I think we're starting to realize that other ways of living and other ways of running your country can be acceptable. Democracy doesn't have to be everywhere. If China can continue to grow in the way it's growing now and continue to contribute to the world in all different ways, 
then everybody can live in peace. It's just that we have to be willing to accept the way they want to live their lives, just as we accept some of the countries in the Middle East, the way they live their lives. We're not happy with a lot of what they do, a la women and things like that, but at the same time, we have to accept it. I think that's the, accept the, the impo most important words, acceptance. Correct, correct. I think so, too. So I thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, now, we did, let's see, we did four of our eight agenda items. Oh. So I might invite you back, if you don't mind, because I do want to talk about a lot of other issues that, uh, in my mind, are important for people to know the real China. Sure. And to really understand, is China a real threat to us? I don't think it is. Uh, I well, thank you very much for joining us today. I'll be back next week on Seymour's World at ThinkTech Hawaii. Aloha. <laughs>